Dr. Ram Subramaniam has also authored several research publications and chapters in textbooks. He has also been the principal investigator in several international drug trials. He is also a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of Glasgow. So I welcome you, doctor. And he is also a Rotarian in the Rotary Club of Madras. Uh, and I would also request everyone, when you all have questions, please do type the questions in the chat box. And our Rotarian, uh, Ravi, would be uh, the moderator for the questions. Over to you, doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Preeti. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and speaking to all of you. Right. So I'll speak to you for about 15, 20 minutes or so, and then uh, we can, uh, I, I'm happy to answer your questions. Now, this is the current scenario of Corona in uh, India and probably definitely in Chennai. You know, we are till recently, we were looking at other states, probably the uh, city of Bombay and Delhi, and the Corona has silently crept uh, on us. And this is right in our midst. And fortunately, it appears that Chennai in the next two, three weeks should reach the peak and then the infections should start coming down. But it appears that the infection is going to definitely start increasing in the smaller towns, Madurai, Trichy, uh, Trinalveli. I think that is going to happen in the next few weeks. If I need to tell you about the history of Corona, it, uh, this is a group of viruses which have been around with us for the last about uh, 50 years or so. Uh, these are viruses which typically cause the common cold symptoms, which means they cause only a heavy headed feeling, cough, a little bit of a blocked nose, sometimes a runny nose. And generally you feel a little miserable, but after three, four days you feel fine. And uh, the initial viruses, what you see as HKU1, NL63, 229E and OC43 are all only viruses in the corona group, which cause a common cold like symptoms. They are called corona because they have a spiky exterior which gives a crown like appearance and the first time they showed any uh, seriousness was in 2002 when a mutation a mutation is a drastic change in the genetic structure of the virus happened resulting in the epidemic we now know as, now know as SARS or the severe acute respiratory syndrome so this virus mutated this originated in the bats in bats most of these viral infections are asymptomatic it originated in bats, passed through the civet cats, and then subsequently infected man, and then started spreading in uh, men. It got the ability to infect lung cells and thereby cause a pneumonia. So the SARS caused a pneumonia, which was fatal in 10% of cases. So this was something very dramatic. But fortunately, because <clears throat> SARS gave us at least four days after the onset of symptoms before a in infected person started spreading it to others, we had enough time to isolate the infected people and thereby block the spread of the pandemic in a matter of a few months. The second major mutation happened in 2012 when we got an infection known as the MERS or the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. This virus also originated as a coronavirus from bats spread through an intermediary host, which is now identified as the camel and then infected man and started spreading in the human race. This virus also had the ability to infect the cells, resulting in a pneumonia. And this virus had a higher mortality rate of almost 35%. We still see an occasional case of MERS. It is still around, but fortunately it is very, very uncommon. Now the third mutation in the group of coronavirus happened in late 2019, probably in the month of November, when this virus again mutated. Again, it was a bat virus to start with, went through probably an intermediary host, which we now think is the pangolin. And this started spreading to man. And it is believed this originated in a wet market or a live seafood and an animal market in Wuhan, a city in the Hubei province of China. If you compare the flu and the COVID-19, there are a lot of similarities because the flu is also a respiratory virus which is spread through droplets from an infected patient. If you look at the R0, the R0 is the term given to the number of people who can be infected by a single infected person. For flu, one infected person infects subsequently another 1.3 people, whereas this is almost twice as infectious, infecting 
anywhere from two to three persons and sometimes can be as high as 5.6 people. So it is far more infectious than the flu. If you look at the incubation time, that is the time taken for the person to manifest the symptoms after acquiring or being exposed to the virus, it is much shorter in flu, about two to four days, whereas for COVID, it is as high as one to 14 days with a median of about four to five days. Please remember that a person starts being infectious to somebody else even two days before the onset of symptoms because this virus multiplies three times as rapidly as the flu. It is believed that if I develop symptoms today, I have already been infectious for the last two days. So this makes it very difficult for us to control the spread because by the time we realize we have an infection, we have already spread it to others. And this is the reason why if during this time, if any of you develop symptoms of COVID-19, which I shall tell you subsequently, the minute you consider the possibility, please isolate yourself because by the time, if you're going to wait another two days before you think about the test, do the test and it takes another day or two to get the reports. In those four or five days, you have definitely spread it to the rest of the family and maybe to others also. The hospitalization rate is about 2% with flu and can be as high as 20% with COVID-19. And the case fatality rate, which is about 0.4% or rather 0.04% with the flu is more than 10 times higher. It is believed that experts feel that the mortality rate is in the region of about 0.5 to 1%. So when you combine the high infectivity and the mortality, which is almost 10 times as much as flu, the number of cases which are involved and hence the number of cases which die can be a significant number. This virus spreads through droplets, which means if I am infected and I am coughing or sneezing or even speaking loudly or singing, the droplets which come out of my mouth can fall within three to five feet on an average and infect the persons who are close to me. If either I am wearing a mask or if the other person who's near me wears a mask, there is a significant possibility that the infectious transmission can be blocked. So this is the main armamentarium by which we prevent the spread by physical distancing and by wearing of masks. The symptoms can be very non-specific. We have now seen that the earlier symptoms which were typically referred to as fever, cough and breathlessness is no longer applicable. Apart from fever, cough and breathlessness, you can get just presentation as chills, severe shaking, muscle pain, back pain, headache, sore throat, and typically one third of people have a loss of smell or taste. This is somehow very typical for COVID and again seen very often in young women especially. And even though it is believed that the smell may return in two weeks, sometimes it, it may takes, take several weeks to, uh, for the symptoms to settle down. The management involves confirmation of the disease by testing. The testing is by what we refer to as a nasopharyngeal swab. A small stick with a cotton tip is uh, inserted into your nose, to the back of your nose, and a scraping is taken. This is the gold standard, but even this test picks up diagnosis only in 70% of cases, which means in 30%, even people with typical symptoms, the test may come back as negative. We also have antibody and antigen tests right now. The antibody tests are not recommended in the acute diagnosis of uh, cases, whereas the antigen tests can be used in specific populations, which the ICMR says include pre-operative patients, patients who are about to deliver, healthcare workers. And if the test is positive, it confirms. If the test is negative, we still need to do an RT-PCR, the nasopharyngeal swab, to confirm the diagnosis. Supportive care is the fundamental approach to managing such patients. Supportive care includes treatment of the fever, body pain with paracetamol, and people who become hypoxic, which means they have a low oxygen level. This is also referred to as happy hypoxia or silent hypoxia because a lot of people don't realize that their oxygen levels are low. They don't complain of breathlessness till it is too late. So oxygen support is what is a main, uh, mainstay of uh, treatment. We need to isolate and I reiterate, if you develop any of the symptoms, severe body pain, chills, sweating, headache, sore throat, cough, please isolate yourself immediately so that you prevent transmission of the virus. You can, if the symptoms persist for 24 to 48 hours, 
then you can consider doing the test and then decide what further uh, needs to be done. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which was purported as uh, important therapeutic interventions in the, at the onset of the disease, now have been shown probably not to be beneficial and they can have a lot of side effects. There are several antivirals which have been tried, which include the flu agents like oseltamivir, interferon agents which have been used for hepatitis virus treatment, anti-HIV drugs, favipravir and remdesivir, but, but amongst all this, it is only probably remdesivir which shows some uh, promise in reducing the duration of illness. There is still no mortality benefit. Favipravir has uh, been introduced with a lot of pomp and show, but so far there is very little evidence to say that favipravir helps. It is believed that the problems happen not only because of the direct involvement of the lungs, which can cause hypoxia, for that, you use antivirals, but it is also because of an immune response by the body. We believe there is something called a cytokine storm. Cytokines are small protein molecules which cause a lot of inflammation. So there are pro-inflammatory cytokines, there are anti-inflammatory cytokines, and it is believed that this virus somehow stimulates the body's pro-inflammatory cytokines to cause a significant inflammation in the lung which can cause hypoxia. To blunt this pro-inflammatory response, we use drugs like steroids, dexamethasone or methylprednisolone. We also use an anti-interleukin antagonist. Interleukin-6 is believed to be a strongly pro-inflammatory molecule. We use tocilizumab um, as one or two doses. It is expensive. It costs about 50,000 rupees or so in blunting the immune response and helping recover the damage to the lungs. We have also been uh, doing studies with convalescent plasma. Convalescent plasma basically refers to the plasma of people who have been infected before and have recovered. So it is believed that their blood may have antibodies which can be used as passive immunization in people who have the disease, but we still don't have uh, significant evidence to say that it helps. We also use anti-clotting agents like heparin because it is believed that the COVID causes a lot of clotting it causes what we refer to as a procoagulant state so it causes clotting in the small blood vessels especially in the lungs which can also uh, you know block the oxygen transmission so we are using now typically heparin we are using steroids we are using if possible remdesivir and if it's still the person is worsening we try agents like tocilizumab the indian council of medical research has recommended the role of uh, hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis or preventive agents to be used in healthcare workers and household contacts of patients who are COVID positive. But there is again very little evidence. We don't know why the ICMR is insisting that this probably helps. So I personally, I have not been taking it. I don't think it helps, but the ICMR does recommend. Again, I reiterate specifically for household contacts of positive cases and healthcare workers in preventing transmission of the disease. So that is the basic uh, info regarding this COVID. I'm going to spend the next about five to seven minutes talking to you about how we can reduce this infection. Now this was referred to as flattening the curve. If you look, the curve has a very steep rise here, which we refer to as the exponential multiplication of the virus. So if this had happened like we had in UK, New York, Spain, and Italy, it would have overwhelmed our healthcare system uh, capacity. So the idea was to blunt or flatten this curve by introduction of lockdown. So the lockdown was introduced at the right time by our prime minister, and it did help significantly in flattening the curve. So even though the number of cases may be same under the red curve and under the blue curve, because we have pushed the curve, we were able to, or we are able to handle the number of cases which are see, which we are seeing now. Otherwise our system would have been overwhelmed and more number of people would have died. So apart from lockdown, what else can be done? Most importantly, as I mentioned, that this virus is transmitted by close proximity of contact. The virus can also be transmitted by inanimate objects when somebody coughs or sneezes, or if I cough and with my hand, which is contaminated with the secretions and the virus, if I touch a doorknob, if I touch a telephone and somebody subsequently handles the same and takes their hair, hands near their face or nose, they can get the infection. But this mode of transmission through inanimate objects or fomites is very, very small. 
it is predominantly a direct transmission which can be prevented by physically distancing it's actually the term social distancing is not correct it is physical distancing and what is safe to do it is safe to go for a walk for a hike play in your yard read a book listen to music cook a meal whatever entails distancing yourself physically from somebody by at least three to six feet is what is recommended if i mentioned earlier you need to isolate yourself if you develop any symptoms or suspect that you could have the infection we refer to as a home quarantine or home isolation this involves staying in a separate room away from others at least six to eight feet away from others restrict your movements to that room only no circumstances leave the house attend any crowds wash your hands frequently avoid sharing household items wear a surgical mask when in the presence of anybody else who may come to give you food or uh, help you dispose of the mask properly and if symptoms arise especially if the fever gets worse if there is severe diarrhea or if there is breathlessness we advise hospital uh, to access hospital uh, care people who are sick need to monitor their oxygen saturations using what we refer to as a pulse oximeter if your saturation of oxygen is more than 94 percent there is no concern but if it drops to 94 percent or less you probably need to access hospital care this is only for patients who are unwell and there is no role for routinely checking oxygen saturation for people who are healthy and with no other symptoms we also have to understand that physical distancing involves avoiding handshaking avoiding fist bumps namaste is probably the new normal and most importantly as the title of my topic says the role of masks if you look at countries where no masks are used versus countries there is where there is a culture of masks hong kong singapore japan south korea where they routinely use masks you will find that there is a significant less number of patients who have been affected by covid and this is now standing the test of time even though masks masks are not foolproof by even reducing it by 20 30 40 50 percent you can reduce the number of infections in fact there is a statistical mathematical modeling where it is believed that if 80 percent of the population wears a mask and we assume that the masks are even 60 percent protective we can probably block the pandemic in a matter of a few weeks to give you a more clear idea if a person who is a covid carrier is not wearing a mask in the presence of somebody who is a contact wears a mask you can reduce the transmission or rather the transmission probably is can be as high as 70 percent which means masks are more important to prevent transmission from you to others rather than protect you so one of my favorite statements i've made earlier is that if you are not your brother's keeper at least don't be his executioner this is a statement by marlon brando and that is what i say that if you wear a mask you protect others in your house more than protecting yourself if the carrier wears a mask and a healthy contact doesn't wear a mask the probability can be reduced to as low as five percent and if both people wear a mask the transmission is as low as 1.5 percent so this tells you the importance of wearing a mask in preventing very importantly transmission from asymptomatic people but also protecting others even if there are two people in the room who are physically distanced more than six to eight feet away it still makes a difference if you wear a mask especially outside your home environment this slide gives the way the the percentage effectiveness of various masks the n95 is recommended only for healthcare workers especially in a hospital environment where aerosol generating procedures are done in these by these procedures we mean that apart from being attached to droplets which travel only five to six feet the virus is attached to very small molecules which can travel through the air more than six feet 10 feet 15 feet especially procedures like nebulization cough induction putting an endotracheal tube to mechanically ventilate a patient extubating it all these can cause aerosol so this is typically only in a hospital environment and an n95 mask is recommended a triple layered surgical mask usually suffices for other healthcare workers for non healthcare workers in the community a simple two or a three layered washable cotton mask is what is recommended and that is good enough to help you in most situations if you have symptoms then you need to wear a triple layered surgical or a medical mask some simple advice do not use your hands to open or pull or push doors use your back or your 
buttocks or your elbows to touch those which are commonly touched. Similarly, elevator buttons don't use fingers because fingers very often go near our face and we can transmit the infection. Use the elbows, especially when you're going by escalators or staircase, do not touch commonly touched areas. Do not lean on the escalator. And if you are handling a mask, always handle it by the elastic or the tie rather than the front of the mask. The more you touch the mask, the greater your hands are likely to be contaminated because if you are inhaling, uh, you know, the virus from somebody else, it coats the outer surface of the mask and you may contaminate it and then your hands may be contaminated. Individual responsibility includes adhering to cough etiquette, which means when you cough or you sneeze, use the crook of your elbow so that you don't splatter the droplets. Frequently wash your hands, use tissues after dumping the tissues, wash your hands, maintain physical distancing, use a cloth mask in public. And if you are unwell, please inform your superior at work and stay home. Please do not split in public, spit in public, come to work if unwell. Do not ignore anxiety and fear. I come across a lot of emotional disturbances during this time. Do not subject yourself to information overload by abusing the social media. In fact, I tell patients, if you're watching the television, watch good old romantic or comedy movies, which make you feel well, not listen to the news. Physical exercise is very important during these times and do not ignore any health advisories. As I mentioned, we see a lot of emotional problems, anxiety and worry about an uncertain future. In fact, it is said that maturity is defined by your ability to handle uncertainty. And very sadly, most of us are at a loss when we face uncertainty. We have fear of contamination, a hypochondriacal fear regarding cough, sore throat. We always believe I get every day. If I see 20 patients out of them, five patients are those who think that they have COVID because they have an irritation in the throat or, uh, you know, a feverish feeling. Holding of personal protective equipment and anger and irritability regarding irresponsible behavior of others in society. Undue attention to unsubstantiated facts. When you read somewhere saying that a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine will protect you, you immediately want to go and take the vaccine. A BCG vaccine protects you, you want to go and take the BCG vaccine with very scant evidence. And, and this is something I can personally, you know, uh, vouch for. An irresistible urge to touch your mouth and face. Your nose starts itching very badly, especially after you've worn a mask. So these are things, unfortunately, we have to put up with. If there are people who run organizations who have factories where a lot of people are working, ensure that shifts are put in place to stagger people coming in so that you don't have crowding in the place of work, stagger your canteen timings. In the canteens, put up plexiglass or glass partitions between people so that you don't, when you talk, especially when you are eating and when you don't wear a mask, you don't transmit the infection. There should be physical separation of staff, encourage virtual meetings rather than meetings where people uh, <clears throat> come and uh, you know uh, congregate. All people should be screened at entry for fever. <clears throat> Air conditioning is perfectly permitted, but ventilation is very important. It is very important to understand that when there is no ventilation in an air conditioned room, the virus persists in the environment for a longer time. You need to ensure personal protective equipment, especially masks and use of hand sanitizers in place of work. Put up awareness posters and very important to disinfect the environment periodically. A simple solution of 0.1% bleach or alcohol if bleach can corrode the instrument is what is recommended. What do we expect? I am very sad to say this that the darkest days are still ahead of us. We have not yet reached the peak. We still have several weeks to go before the peak, peak comes in. And this is like a marathon. This is not a sprint. We have to prepare ourselves. There is no going back to normal. There is going to be a new normal, which is going to be with us for several weeks, months, and probably years. The laws of viral physics, where it multiplies exponentially, will not bend to public policy or our hopes. <clears throat> Also remember that the transmission is related both to the dose, which means if somebody close to us talks to us, you know, coughs or sneezes in front of our face, the risk is very high. And also the time, even if they are six feet away, but if you are going to spend six to eight hours in an air conditioned room or traveling in a bus or traveling in a flight, it increases the risk because of the time of exposure. Is the end of the pandemic near? Unfortunately not. This is likely to go on for several months. We know that even if we get over this, there is a second wave coming. China is already facing the second wave. So 
It is believed that the only way this pandemic can end is if at least 60% of the population is infected. To reach this level, it is going to hit at least three to five years or a vaccine is available. I know there is a lot of uh, you know, social media information going that the vaccine trials have started and by August we will get a vaccine. Unfortunately, in spite of being inherently optimistic, I don't think this is possible. You have to be realistic that to check the efficacy and the safety of a vaccine will take several months. So I think we have to prepare ourselves at least for the next several months or years to cope with this pandemic. What about the future scan? All of us need to have a date with health, adopt a family physician, use a trusted source for health information. In fact, I have started and I, I run a capstone clinic and I have an Insta handle uh, at the capstone says, which I try to give authentic information because we are bombarded with information, most of which unfortunately is not uh, based on medical evidence. And I am a very strong proponent of adult vaccinations, whether it is a flu vaccine, whether it's a pneumonia vaccine, I think we need to check with our healthcare provider and ensure that if it is indicated, we take the vaccine. Lastly, I think what saves lives is discipline. Look at this boy, you know, he may be naked, but he still wears a mask. So what we need to remember as a take home message is ensure physical distancing, ensure universal masking, which means you step outside your house, whether it is to see your neighbor, whether it is to buy, you know, vegetables in the vendor outside your gate, you need to wear a mask. The only way we can keep ourselves safe is if we assume that every person whom we meet is likely to be either symptomatic or an asymptomatic COVID-19 patient who can be transmitting the disease. Ensure frequent hand washing, cough etiquette, avoid spitting, stay at home if you're sick, environmental hygiene with bleach, this is mainly in commonly touched surfaces, avoid travel at least in the near future, and take up adult vaccinations when it is indicated. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop my sharing and I shall take up questions now. Thank you, doctor, for the information. And uh, now over to uh, Ravi. Uh, Ravi, uh, please uh, take up the questions with the doc. Yeah. And you all can post your questions on the chat. Ravi would be moderating it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, doctor, for this uh, lovely presentation. Uh, to start off, uh, uh, I must say that uh, you did speak about information overload, but the, the way you made the presentation starting from the causes to what to expect uh, is the right kind of information that we can do with at any point of time. Uh, In fact, I'll there's now a start term called uh, information bewilderment. There is such a lot of information that it bewilders us. It doesn't, uh, you know, have clarity, unfortunately. So yeah. that's the problem of this age. Yeah. I also see uh, that you have a very infectious sense of humor. Uh, uh, the, the way you started off the presentation by showing a lion uh, beside the vehicle and somebody pointing to say that uh, you can, can you see a lion some miles away? So uh, that's on the side. And I'll start off by uh, asking uh, a few questions on behalf of members who are posting questions. The first of them is from Deepika Goel. And she's asking, how accessible is Remdesivir in Chennai hospitals? A, right, a, a very relevant question uh, at this point of time. Now, Remdesivir, as I told you, is the only antiviral agent which is believed to probably shorten the duration of illness. There is no benefit to say that it improves mortality, though there is probably statistically a trend towards improving mortality. It costs, uh, it's a five day course. It costs roughly about 50,000 rupees for those five days, about 8,000 rupees per dose. First day you need to take 200 milligrams, double the dose, and for another four days, 100 milligrams. Uh, it has been uh, manufactured. The manufacturer in India has started with uh, hetero drugs and CIPLA. The stocks are still pretty limited, so it is not freely available yet. but Gilead, the original manufacturer, it is believed almost 80% of the stocks have been held back by the United States. Uh, the local stockists will give you, but there is a significant shortage. So I think it is not yet very freely available. Okay, thanks. And also uh, we have this uh, news of uh, the United States of America trying to get uh, the entire chunk of uh, Remedy Zever away to their country. So... <laughs> 
So the, the second question uh, from Preeti herself, uh, will Siddha medicines help? We know for a fact that the Tamil Nadu government has uh, actively uh, advocating the uh, use of, or drink of this concoction, which we call this Kabasara Kudinir. So Preeti uh, asks if Siddha medicines will help. Now, I am an allopathic doctor. I don't know much about Siddha. But uh, the feeling I get is whenever you have no specific treatment, the number of options available dramatically goes up. You know, in fact, we say there is a saying in medicine that the number of articles published about a topic is inversely related to the effective treatments available for that. So like that, we have no specific treatment. I told you the only treatment in allopathic medicine for COVID-19 proven, recommended by agencies till recently have been only two, which is symptomatic using paracetamol and two oxygen. Only recently steroids and maybe anti-clotting agents are helpful. So in this situation, everybody has their own therapeutic option, whether it is, you know, neem leaves, whether it is turmeric, whether it is salt water, hot water, gargling, you can access a million cures for COVID-19, which include Arsenica album, Kabasura Kudinir, Zinc, Vitamin C, none of them have, have do we have any medical evidence to say that it helps. So I personally don't believe in anything. All you need is paracetamol, rest, and if you become hypoxic, oxygen support, nothing else. The next question is from Meeta Venkatraman, and she's asking is, is gel neti effective? What is gel neti? I okay, not... Meeta, can you just uh, clarify? On, can you unmute and clarify yeah. what you meant by uh, gel neti? Uh, it is, uh, you clean the nasal passage with warm water. It's the Ayurvedic uh, and yogic uh, exercise. And a lot of doctor friends in Bombay, which is very badly hit, are recommending uh, this as a thing to yes, prevent. I, I have heard, in fact, I saw a post in the social media where in Kokila Ben Hospital, uh, all the healthcare workers who have been doing gel niti have been protected and those who have not been using have come down. You know, this is like saying that, you know, if you don't forward this to 25 other people, then you get struck by the illness, something like that. No, there is no medical evidence. I'm talking about science. There is no evidence to say. It is all nice to hear and something to do. But unfortunately, we don't have medical evidence for me to recommend it. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I just Sanjay, like to add here, uh, Ravi. Carry on, Sanjay. That if yes. Jalneti is not done as per procedure, what is taught in yoga, then it can uh, do a lot of harm than do good, you know. Whether it, it prevents COVID or not is another case. Okay. And uh, Sanjay has another question which is put up in the chat. What kind of adult vaccinations are available, doctor? See, we believe that whatever vaccines we take as a child protects us through I all the <laughs> old age. Unfortunately, just like not you charge yourself not batteries, working. you change clothes as you grow older, I want to you know, your size increases. We need to have periodic boosters of childhood vaccines. And there are certain vaccines which adults need, which are not given in child, childhood. Your tetanus injection, which you take as a childhood course, you need to have a booster every 10 years. Earlier, we only looked at tetanus. Now we know that tetanus and diphtheria should be taken every year, every 10 years. And one dose of tetanus diphtheria produces also is needed for all adults. Apart from this, all of us need a flu shot annually. So every year during the September, when the new flu shot comes, all of us need the flu shot. People who are over the age of 65, people who have underlying heart disease, lung disease, or other, uh, you know, uh, liver or kidney disease need protection from invasive pneumococcal disease, which is a pneumonia which can spread and we need to have our pneumococcal vaccine. So these are the common ones. Apart from this, people who are over the age of 60 will benefit from the shingles or the herpes zoster vaccine. There are several vaccines which may be related to travel, which may include hepatitis A, hepatitis B. It may include yellow fever. So depending on your age, your underlying illnesses, your travel or occupation, you may also need more adult vaccines. Okay, thank you, doctor. Uh, one question from uh, me. Uh, you are a COVID warrior. 
and how traumatic is it for you people out there when you see a lot of these cases and when you see a lot of patients you're dealing with on a daily basis i i sort of would beg to differ uh, with you in a couple of uh, issues one we are not the frontline warriors you are all the frontline warriors because the problem is in the community by the time they come to the hospital we are ready we are prepared in fact i feel that hospital is the safest place for most people rather than in the community because community you don't know who has it is it your vegetable vendor is it your maid who comes to your house to sweep and mop is it your neighbor who may be an asymptomatic uh, you know infected person or a pre symptomatic person whom if you let into your house may spread the disease to you so that is the frontline warrior when they come to the hospital i know whether they are having symptoms i am masked the base person is masked i take all the precautions so actually we are the rear end we are the rear support so if we come down it is already too late which is what is happening now you are all the frontline warriors now with regard as i told you to how we manage in hospital i am very happy in the hospital because i know what to expect we are all given personal protective equipment which if we use appropriately the chances of transmission is very very small in fact studies from the west have already shown that healthcare workers who get the infection it is more likely they get the infection in the community rather than from the hospital so you know i i as i said i would beg to differ that i feel much safer in the hospital than in the community and i'm worried when the lockdown goes off it's going to be a very very difficult proposition for most of us because we are going to be very casual in our approach even during lockdown lockdown i find nobody is wearing mask either the mask is here or here and what happens is even my clinic when i call patients i have the chair which is put at least 3 feet away from the other edge of the table they come sit they drag their chair right up to the table they put their hands they put their mask down and then they start talking you know we are not used to the culture of masks we are uncomfortable people say oh i feel suffocated i can't talk with a mask on we can't see a patient's lip, person's lips move when the person speaks with a mask on so it is very difficult i agree but please for heaven's sake physical distancing and universal masking appropriately and always when you are out of the house is your only protection against covid-19 okay uh, someone here vikram is uh, tired of staying at home he is asking a question which may not be directly relevant for you to answer but anyway the question goes when will schools reopen maybe someone else can help with the answer schools uh, as of now i think it is probably going to be in september i don't think it will be earlier see we all can wear wear masks adults can wear masks but children i don't think it is we can expect or i don't think they're going to wear masks one two fortunately unlike the flu the covid-19 is very mild in children and in pregnant women you know the flu can cause severe infections and death in children under the age of 5 and in pregnant women whereas the covid-19 somehow spares children and pregnant women and they get only a mild infection they may have a little stuffy nose a runny nose for a couple of days a low grade fever for a day and they are fine so children i am not bothered at all in fact there is a multi inflammatory system disease which has been seen in children but they do respond very well even if they get it and this is uncommon but still it is manageable the problem is with people over the age of 60 and when children go to schools and bring the infection back from schools and spread it to their grandparents because they hug they play they kiss that is more worrisome when grandparents come down that worries me so the problem is with schools is not that children will get the infection it is that the children will pass the infection to elderly at home and they will have mortality it has been shown that people the mortality is i was telling you about 0.5 to 1% in the general public as you grow older when you cross 60 the mortality goes up people with underlying heart disease high blood pressure and diabetes are at an increased risk and when you cross 80 the mortality can be as high as 15% so that is what is worrying one question from uh, preeti what precautions should uh, a pregnant lady be taking under the current scenario as i mentioned fortunately pregnancy is a condition where even if they get the infection it is very mild 
they don't get affected significantly it is not transmitted through delivery to the baby it is not found in breast milk so the world health organization has said that pregnant women who deliver who are covid positive can breastfeed their babies they need to wear a mask they need to wash their hands when they handle the babies but it is safe because breast milk milk is more important than worrying about consequences of covid so uh, you know it is fortunately a, a, a low uh, risk issue uh, right now uh, covid and pregnancy yeah, thank, thank you doctor uh, ravi i have to do something ravi can i ask one question please uh, yeah can... yes yes please dr ram subramanian uh, doc- doctor thanks a lot for a lovely presentation you have cleared most of our doubts one common doubt that all of us have recently we were contemplating of uh, catering food for our virtual meeting there was uh, two schools of thought what are your uh, thoughts on chance of transmission through food such as takeaways or groceries newspapers etc etc close to zero i think this uh, this uh, concern about swiggy and uh, food pizza deliveries newspapers milk packets vegetables completely unfounded as i told you the majority of transmission is direct close from one person to another whether symptomatic or otherwise as i told you you tend to start becoming infectious even two days before symptoms so pre symptomatic asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic people are the ones who transmit the infection the chances of infection spreading through vegetables through milk packets through you know swiggies very very unlikely and even assuming that the swiggy delivery boy has an infection he has touched his nose he has contaminated the surface of your pizza box all you need to do is when it comes home you take the pizza out of it the pizza itself is not contaminated or the food itself is not contaminated it is only the container as long as you wash your hands after you handle the container it is more than enough newspapers you can't wash the newspapers so read your newspapers don't touch your face after you finish reading wash your hands that is all you need to do nothing more thank you that was a good question in the prospect because the next uh, week same time we are having a, a meeting of the club and there is discussion going on whether to distribute takeaways uh, for that meeting uh, the next question is from mukund and he is asking two questions how did china come out of this pandemic is one the second is should we take influenza vaccine now i am a little uh, skeptical about the information we get out of china Uh, but china was draconian in its measures they completely locked off wuhan and when you say locking off 11 million people in one city they walled it off completely and ensured that it didn't leave wuhan so whatever happened before the lockdown was inserted caused the spread but otherwise they were very very you know in a military precision they controlled the cases they sorted out all the cases they checked everybody they isolated they did a great job which is not possible in india so that could be one reason but i also have reservations that the statistics we see may be a little warped i don't know so the only way see singapore has managed very well taiwan japan they are all managed very well for two three reasons one they have aggressively tested people they have aggressively checked out for contact they have traced the contact and they have isolated the people for this you need the cooperation of the citizens when people coming from abroad you know indians coming from abroad take paracetamol so that when they land here when temperature is checked they don't have fever then they go spread the infection to others unfortunately that is not the way we can win this war it should be individual responsibility discipline and cooperation the same thing we see for lockdown you go out you see normal life you go to you know when lockdown is slightly relaxed relax, people flood the markets fish markets in tiruvattur coimbedu markets and other markets which unfortunately is not very comfort so without individual citizen discipline i don't think we can win it doc can i ask you one question i am karthik here how often do you have to change your mask every time you go out you have to change your mask cloth. no these are cloth masks that we use cloth mask any mask can be worn till it is moist till it is you know damaged or till it is soiled so once it is soiled if it is a three layered mask or a n95 you need to dispose it a cloth mask can be taken off washed and reused in general a surgical mask can be worn for four to six hours at a time on an average 
after that it tends to be soiled and n95 which is more expensive again 4 to 6 hours but if it is intact an n95 can be put in a breathable paper bag for 3 days and reused again but public doesn't need that 95 so for the public if you are using a triple layer surgical or a medical mask use 4 to 6 hours and then throw it you can't reuse it please do not reuse your n95 i have seen people who wash and reuse the n95 the public no if you are using a cloth mask if it becomes wet or your you know your breath makes it moist after 4 to 6 hours you know put it away for wash and reuse keep three or four masks which you can reuse again if it is a washable so we wash it in soap and water and we, we can reuse that. that's more than enough. that's more than enough yeah. Love, Dr. Dr. next Dr. question Dr. mahim yeah uh, doctor is it okay to take an influenza vaccine even now in general the new flu vaccine for the northern hemisphere comes every september so i would say having waited till july wait till september or october as soon as a new vaccine comes take it and every year it should be around september october that you need to have your flu shot and the flu shot doesn't help covid covid is different flu is different don't expect the flu shot to cross cover for covid i have a question and doctor every time we go out and we come back home do we need to change our clothes or is it okay to keep them on it depends on where you are going if you are going to your office where your interaction with others is less i don't think you need to but if you are going in a crowded place where and for sort of for example if you travel in spite of your best efforts there will not be physical distancing you will sometimes brush against people or sometimes when you go to the market or your your you know a uh, uh, grocery shop there will be chances when you will scrape past people so in that case yes please wash it but if you are physically distanced i would and i don't think we need to every time we come back i don't think we need to wash it yeah doctor i have a question this is venkatesh yeah yeah uh, my mother is currently stuck in the us uh, she is in seattle she is 60 plus and uh, she has already overstayed there and if she is planning to come back to india would this be an ideal time and my second question is she is traveling what precautions uh, should she take during the travel as i told you this is not going to disappear another two weeks so there is no ideal time the question is okay. not when <coughs> how are you going to do it which means she needs to be educated about physically distancing herself whenever she is traveling whichever you know city whichever area she is in she needs to ensure physical distancing always wear a mask always frequently sanitize your hands with alcohol sanitizer because we have a very bad tendency to take our hands even if i look around now lot of people are having face and which i also do very often so when we take our hands near our face especially after touching public surfaces that is risky so alcohol sanitization mask and physical distancing is the only protection for all of us dr this is chandeshekar here i have a question uh to improve one's immunity will it uh, the chances of getting a covid will lessen and what are the things to do any medication for increase your immunity to avoid this the only way you're going to have a good immunity is the basic principles one a balanced nutritious meal whether it is vegetarian or non vegetarian two adequate rest which means sleep of at least 7 hours to 8 hours on an average three physical activity and exercise especially as you grow older four discretion with smoking and alcohol five adult immunization these are the only proven ways to bolster your immunity the role of zinc and vitamin c even though is played in a big way there is some role for these in preventing upper respiratory viral infections but overdosing them is no role there is no specific role for vitamin c or zinc with respect to covid they are non specific three in patients who are malnourished yes it helps but routinely taking overloading us with vitamin c or zinc to protect against covid no role doctor uh, still on the subject of masks pankaj has a question and he is asking there are still people who are not convinced about wearing masks while going for walks on roads they say they are not supposed to wear a mask while walking briskly and related question from preeti is that she says she is a runner and she finds it difficult and uncomfortable while running with a mask these are related questions 
Yes, it is not advisable to wear a mask when you're physically exerting yourself, which means running or brisk walking or cycling or whatever. Yes, please avoid masks, which means if you're doing any of these, do it where you're away from others. If you're physically distanced from others, there is no issue. So you choose a time, you choose a place where nobody is going to be around. You take your mask off and run. That's perfectly fine. But yes, wearing masks has been shown to reduce the oxygen supply to the brain, especially as you grow older or people with underlying lung diseases. So I don't think brisk walking. So if you have to walk, walk slowly if you are in the presence of others. If you're doing brisk walking or running, do it without a mask, but at a time and a place where others are not going to be around. But if there are somebody around, how much distance should be between the other person and me? Couple of meters. Okay. Danya has a question. Once you recover, I presume that is, it is from COVID. Is there a chance of reinfection? As of now, we know that the antibody response to this infection is still very, very poor. So even people who recover, only 50% show significant protective antibodies. Having said that, we believe that like other viral infections, getting the infection once should give you some amount of immunity. So we don't have proof to say that you cannot get the infection again. But logically, it seems likely that you will be protected. We have to wait and see. Great question. Uh, is taking a vitamin a day a regular dosage or over dosage? This concept of taking vitamins is uh, predominantly a pharmaceutical initiative, uh, both in the US and in India. Most other countries, they don't really recommend vitamins and there is no, again, I think it's evidence to say that vitamins improve things. If you are deficient, yes. But if you are otherwise a person who eats a well-balanced, nutritious meal, there is no role for vitamins. So if you want to take, especially as you're growing over the age of 50 or 60, you want to take a vitamin, one tablet of any one vitamin or, or a, what you call as a multivitamin tablet is perfectly fine. Are we? Singapore, Singapore has a started schools with masks i mean all the schools the kids have the face mask the shield if we had 10% of the discipline which singapore has we would have gone places that's true and also the, the we also have a huge population so i guess that, that must be a big challenge too absolutely absolutely uh, so like in uh, mumbai and uh, we have a lot of slums so like Haravi or something. Uh, do you expect a major outbreak in these things? Absolutely. Wherever there is crowded, wherever there is an increased density of population, the disease spreads very fast. So that is why it is said the chances of getting the disease is much lesser outside than inside. In future, if you are planning a gathering, you are having a function at home, maybe three months down, six months road, do it outside. An air-conditioned room where there is a lot of crowding is a much higher risk than having an open air function where there is a lot of ventilation. Because uh, thank you. I one question. Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Uh, this is Kalpana here. Uh, when we are running past somebody or walking swiftly past somebody who is not socially distanced, physically distanced, is it is it that much of a threat without wearing a mask? There are studies which show that when you run past, you create a draft. There is a flow of air, especially when you run past. Suppose you are walking here and somebody is crossing you who's running you. He creates a draft. And if you not wear the mask, there is a theoretical risk that there is an increased virus which may cross your path. But if the other person is wearing a mask, that is very, very minimal. So even if a runner is not wearing a mask, if you are walking on the other side or even on the same side with a mask on, that minimizes the risk. Last uh, two questions. Does anybody have a question? Yeah, uh, yeah. Ahmad. Can yeah. I ask one? Sorry. Uh, Ahmad, yeah. carry on. Yeah. Uh, does exercising enhance the immunity level in a person? Like, you know? Absolutely. Physical exercise okay. improves your immunity. So, definitely, yes. Okay. And the exercise recommended is. 30 minutes a day, at least five days a week, which is about 150 minutes a week is what is recommended. This is not, oh, at work, I climb two flights of stairs. Oh, I, when I work, cook at home, I walk, walk to the front and the kitchen all the time. No, I'm talking about dedicated exercise, whatever it is. 
and should okay. we use the oximeter regularly at home or no? no it is only as i mentioned for sick people it is not for healthy people it has no role okay doctor re re recently must have seen in the social media that the icmr is go going to roll out a vaccine by august 15th and things like that what are your thoughts on that it is not rolling out studies have started as i think i mentioned that the, by the time we have safety and efficacy results the minimum of 12 to 18 months. so i am not get, uh, anticipating anything if it is anything less than that i'll be not surprised i'll be shocked uh, going by you know what we have cleaned over the last several decades it's going to take a little longer than 3 uh, months thank you so much uh, doctor uh, i re we really like uh, uh, your 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 presentation and the answers that you have uh, made out very patiently uh, in particular there are simple takeaways from your uh, speech and uh, the first is of course such a simple thing as mask which is your title anyway about uh, not being uh, not getting worked up just practice simple things to get over the situation and the second is the words of caution that uh, this is not to, going to go away anytime soon but we have to prepare ourselves in all possible manner and uh, with with simple suggestions such as masks social distancing exercise and physical well being thank you so much for being with us doctor we really appreciate the time that you have spent with us this evening thank, thank you doctor thank you so much doctor thank you doctor oh, it's a great day for thank us you. thank you thank you doctor thank you doctor thank you thank you doctor, thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.